Hello and welcome to my class on a simplified approach to 5-axis machining. My name is Ann Mazakis and I'm the manager of technical communications at DP Technology, the developer of Esprit CAD CAM software. I want to show you that programming a 5-axis machine is easier than it looks, so let's get started. This class introduces an approach to CAM functionality that simplifies the methodology of multi-axis machining into one unique CAM function called a composite function. By following the same logic that machinists use when deciding how to program a part, the composite function is familiar and easy to understand, yet flexible and powerful enough to exploit the full capabilities of advanced machine tools today and in the future. At the end of this class, you will be able to understand how 5-axis machines work, exploit the capabilities of multi-axis machines without struggling to learn multiple CAM functions, describe a simplified four-step CAM methodology for multi-axis machining, explain how a single milling function can combine a range of popular toolpath definitions, and maintain complete control over the tool axis orientation during the cut. Before I get into CNC programming details, let's start by taking a look at how 5-axis machines work. If you're already familiar with 5-axis, please stick with me for a few minutes. Standard machines can only move in X, Y, and Z. 5-axis machines have two additional axes of rotation. Most machine tool builders identify their rotary axes according to the ISO standard, which is that the A axis rotates around X, the B axis rotates around Y, and the C axis rotates around Z. You need to be aware that some machine builders use their own naming conventions that may be different, but the principle is the same. In this photo, the machine is equipped with a rotary table mounted on a trunnion table. The trunnion uses A-axis movement to tilt the part around the X-axis, and the rotary table rotates around Z for C-axis motion. By tilting and turning the part, you can cut from virtually any direction. You can now get 5-axis machines that are similar in size to a standard mill, and at a price that makes them absolutely affordable to even the smallest shops and the versatility of these machines make them very appealing, since you can do so much more with just one machine. Even though 5-axis machining is associated with complex geometries, like impellers and cylinder head porting, it's important to remember that 5-axis machines aren't the exclusive domain of aerospace companies or race car builders. It's much more common that 5-axis machines are used for five-sided machining, to reduce setup time and eliminate the typical flipping of parts that's required on three-axis machining centers. This lets you increase the profit margin per part, plus you increase accuracy when you switch from moving parts around on standard mills to mounting them once on a five-axis machining center and machining all sides. Let's take a look at some common machine configurations. In the first example, the two rotary axes are located in the table. The B axis tilts and the C axis rotates the part. Linear motion is handled by the milling head. In the second example, the table still rotates in C, but now the tilt is in the tool. If we look at the same table tool combination on a mill turn machine, the turning spindle becomes the C axis to rotate the part and the tilt of the tool is controlled by the B axis. The linear axes are located differently on a lathe, with the Z axis positioned horizontally along the spindle axis instead of vertically along the tool axis. In the last example, the two rotary axes are located in the milling head to rotate and tilt the tool into any position. True 5-axis machining refers to the ability to feed the tool through the cut using all axes to smoothly follow a contoured surface. After all, 5-axis machines were first developed for the aerospace industry to do just that. In this example of a blade, the rotary axes move continuously during the cut. 
What you may not realize is that you don't have to use all five axes at the same time to get great benefits. One of the most practical applications is called 3 plus 2 machining. You use the rotary axes to rotate the part into position before the start of each cut and then run a standard 3-axis toolpath. This makes programming easy since you only need to worry about rotary motion between operations. 3 plus 2 machining also allows you to rotate the part into a position that lets you reach deep areas with shorter tools. That way you don't have to deal with the problem of tool deflection. Another practical application is to lock only one of the axes, which is called 4 plus 1 machining. In this photo, the B axis on a mill turn is tilted and locked into position while still allowing the part to rotate. The B axis spindle is more rigid when used in this configuration. Here's an example of a part rotating continuously while the tool cuts. If you look at the milling head, you can see that it's locked into one position, which is vertical. So this is continuous 5-axis machining that's been converted to 4 plus 1. Now you can see 3 plus 2 machining, where the part is held stationary as the tool cuts. Then the part can be rotated to a new position before cutting begins again. Now let's take a look at why 5-axis has become so popular. Saving time and money is at the top of the list. Loading a part on the machine only once saves on part handling because no one has to move the part from machine to machine or from one fixture to another. It also means that you only have to build one part holding fixture for multiple operations. Another big benefit is the improvement in accuracy between operations on multiple faces since the part doesn't need to be touched by human hands from the time it's loaded until it's unloaded. The positional accuracy in the machine takes care of everything for you. And let's not forget the most important people, your customers. You can deliver orders faster and with better quality. You can also reach more markets by expanding the range of part geometries you can cut. A 5-axis machine can also help you streamline your machining processes by combining them on one machine. Now that you've seen the benefits of 5-axis, your challenge is how to generate CNC programs that fully exploit the capabilities of these machines. The first step is to rethink your current processes. I'm talking about the design process as well as the machining process. If you have traditionally used different processes to machine and assemble components, you may be able to combine them into a single component that was previously too complex to machine. The next challenge is to wrap your head around all the combinations of motion that are not only possible but practical. If you ask two programmers to machine the exact same part, I can guarantee the two programs will be different because each person will attack the part from different directions. But remember that both programs will ultimately produce the same part so your primary goal is to use the machine motion as efficiently as possible. It's critical that you avoid collisions between moving components. The smallest programming error can generate costly damages because the materials, high precision tools, and accessories for these advanced machine tools can be quite expensive. And finally, you need to stay within the limits of the machine. There are physical limits on how far each axis can travel and there are limits on just how fast those axes can move in relation to one another. Linear motion is always faster and more accurate than rotary motion, so you need to control acceleration to prevent backlash when an axis moves too fast. A CAM system can make the programming process easier by examining how the best machinists go about their work and then embedding that logic into the software. Using the same logic as machinists, lets the system provide guidance along the way for new programmers and provides a familiar environment for experienced programmers. But guidance must never be used to impose limitations. Five-axis programming can be compared to the artistic process of sculpting, which means that programmers must have creative freedom when deciding how to cut apart. CAM systems also provide a risk-free proving ground for watching every movement of the machine, 
Every machine component, every movement can be defined in the CAM system and then run in real time on the computer. The advantage is that there are no doors or coolant to impede your view. And you're not risking an expensive chunk of metal when you notice a gouge. Getting the best NC output happens when the software developer works in partnership with machine tool builders. These partnerships let the companies work together on real machines and real parts to develop better toolpath and better NC output to produce exactly what you see on your screen. When you receive one of these post-processor files, you know that it's been tested on the same machine sitting on your shop floor. The key to creating an elegant solution is to start by throwing away the idea that each type of 5-axis work needs a specialized function. That approach is confusing and unnecessary. A simpler approach is to create a single function that meets the needs of the majority of 5-axis work. To simplify software development, the composite function is composed of a set of interlocking modules, somewhat like building blocks. Each module is designed to perform well separately and together. The modular design of the software allows for easy testing and expansion when technology changes in the future. This type of software development is not only faster to implement, it results in a more reliable software. Another way to simplify the software is to design an interface that responds intelligently to the choices being made. In this example, the tool strategy will keep the tool axis normal to the model at all times. You can see that there are three options for this strategy that let you control the forward and sideways tilt of the tool. Let's see what happens if you change the strategy to one that has the tool follow a path. Now you have new options that let you select the curve for the path and define how the tool will travel along that curve. Another strategy is to orient the tool axis through a fixed point. This time, you have options for selecting the location and direction of the point. This step-by-step -step guidance helps the user avoid errors without imposing limitations. Now it's time to see the composite function in action. To keep things simple, the composite function follows four simple steps. These steps are based on the standard workflow for any type of machining. Whether it's 2-axis or 5-axis, lay their mill. It just makes sense to align the technology with the same logic that machinists already use. The first step is to define the areas you will be machining and the areas you want to exclude. In this picture, the green area is selected for machining and all the faces in the red area will be avoided. The next step is to define the shape of the path the tool will follow. This is also called the machining pattern. The picture shows a pattern that follows the flow lines of the surfaces. I'll be talking about the different options for machining patterns in a few minutes. After the shape of the path is defined, the user can decide how the tool will be oriented as it travels along that path. As you've seen, a 5-axis machine gives you a lot of flexibility in how you rotate the part or tool. You'll be very interested in the strategies I'll be showing you later. And finally, the last step is to decide how the tool transitions between each cutting pass. In this example, the links at the end of the cutting passes are fairly straightforward curves, but I'll be showing you other strategies later. In the first step, you define the area to machine in a specialized feature called a freeform feature. A freeform feature lets you select and save the surfaces to be machined, shown in green, and the surfaces to be avoided as a single object. For this blisk, separate features were created for the blade, for the fillet at the base of the blade, and another feature for the hub. When you're ready to start programming, it's much easier to select these predefined features. An advantage to feature-based machining is that the feature can be reopened at any time if you need to add or remove surfaces. What's nice is that any machining operations placed on the feature are automatically updated when the feature is edited. In this example, toolpath is applied to the blade feature. When I edited the feature to remove a face, the system updated the toolpath for me. Let's take a look at how easy it is to create a freeform feature. The interface for the freeform feature lets you select the faces to machine and the faces to avoid. 
This model has lots of separate faces, so I'm going to use propagation to make this selection faster. I've already set up a rule to select all faces that share the same color. First, I'll select the solid faces I want to machine. To use propagation, I hold down the shift key and select only one face. All the gray faces are added to the part list where they can be highlighted on the screen. The same process is used to select the check surfaces that need to be avoided. To make the selection of check surfaces faster, an entire solid model can be selected. The system is smart enough to automatically exclude any surfaces in the part list. Once you click OK, the feature is created and added to the feature list. Clicking on the feature highlights it in the work area. Double clicking on the feature opens it for editing so you can add or remove faces at any time. That's all there is to it. Now let's find out how to apply the toolpath. Now that the area to machine is defined, the next step is to decide what the toolpath will look like on that area. The composite function includes six types of machining patterns that are common to multi-axis machining. There is a standard parametric pattern that takes its shape from the flow lines of the model itself. There is also a projected parametric pattern that projects the flow lines of a separate surface onto the model. You can also use a separate surface to project a spiral pattern onto the model for a continuous uninterrupted cut. Two types of planar machining are also available. One that follows a straight path and another that follows a curved path. And finally we have an offset pattern that takes its shape from the boundary of the area to machine. Let's discuss each pattern and its typical application. The preferred toolpath for contoured surfaces is a parametric toolpath because parametric machining follows the natural flow lines of the surface. In the composite function you have two options for parametric machining. You can use the flow lines from a surface on the model itself as shown in this picture. Or you can project the flow lines from a separate surface onto the model. When you machine directly from the flow lines on the model, the quality of the machining depends largely on the quality of the original CAD model. As long as the flow lines in the CAD model are smooth and continuous, the toolpath will be too. But CAD models aren't always perfect. In this model you can see that the flow lines on the faces are out of alignment. The tool won't be able to make a smooth transition from one face to the other when the flow lines don't match up. That's where the knitted surface function comes in. The knitted surface shown here overcomes the problem of misaligned faces by creating a single continuous surface on the solid model. The knitted surface can then be used to drive a parametric machining pattern on the underlying model. That way, smooth and continuous toolpath can be generated without changing the original part model. A machining pattern that's almost identical to parametric machining is spiral machining. This type of toolpath also uses the projected flow lines of a separate surface. The only difference is that it's always used on a closed shape like this example. In this example, a knitted surface was also used as the projection surface for all the faces underneath. Spiral toolpath is also useful for projecting cutting passes onto a model with a cylindrical shape. A big benefit of spiral passes is that the cutter stays in contact with the part at all times. This makes it ideal for high speed machining because there are no sharp transitions in the toolpath. One of the oldest and most classic machining patterns is the planar option. Planar toolpath has relatively uniform spacing between cutting passes and is used when you want to start cutting at one end of a part and stop cutting at a specified distance. The composite function supports classic planar cutting that lets you enter a vector to define the direction and distance for the evenly spaced cutting passes. Another option is to select a drive curve instead of a straight vector. In that case, the distance between cutting passes is calculated by spacing the slice planes for the planar cuts at equal distances along the curve. And finally, we have another classic machining pattern, which is the offset pattern. 
This pattern works well on areas with a defined boundary. The shape of the outer boundary is calculated and then progressively offset towards the center. As with any other offset toolpath, the tool can start in the center and move progressively outward, or start on the outer boundary and move progressively inward. Along with the shape of the toolpath, you need to be concerned with the distribution of points along the path. If the distance between the points varies too much, you'll have a problem with the way the machine accelerates and decelerates between those points. In this example, toolpath analysis shows an uneven distribution of points along the toolpath. There is a high compression of points as the tool swings around the edges and large gaps along the curve in between. This is going to have a bad effect on the acceleration of the machine and produce a terrible finish. Now take a look at this toolpath. The distance between points is limited to produce a smoother toolpath and to improve the performance of the machine. After the machining pattern is defined, the fun of 5-axis begins with the decision on how to orient the tool axis. Some of your choices will depend on the capability of the machine and some on what you want to achieve with the surface finish. The composite function has five strategies for the tool orientation. You can keep the tool axis normal to the model at all times. If you're using a separate surface to project the toolpath, you can use that surface to control the tool orientation instead of the model. If you're machining through some sort of opening, you can restrict the tool axis to only pass through a specified point. If you need to machine inside some sort of channel, you can restrict the tool to follow along a specified path. And for 3 plus 2 machining, you'll choose a fixed vector for the tool axis. Let's discuss each option in detail. A classic strategy for simultaneous 5-axis machining is to keep the tool axis perpendicular to the surfaces being cut at all times. This strategy works extremely well on this blade, since the flow lines on the CAD model are smooth and continuous. Let's take a closer look at this toolpath. We're using a projected spiral toolpath to keep the tool on the blade at all times. In the toolpath definition, we've also chosen to machine the whole surface, and the step increment is set to 3 mm for a semi-finished cut. You can also see that I have decided to limit the distribution of points in the toolpath. If we look on the orientation tab, you can see that we've chosen the normal to model option. As you can see, the shape of the toolpath and the orientation of the tool are defined separately. Now let's see how the toolpath simulates. This blade is being milled on a mill turn machine with a B axis. You can see that a combination of part rotation and tool tilt are used to keep the tool normal to the model at all times. As previously discussed, the flow lines on the CAD model may be less than ideal for machining. Depending on the complexity of the model being cut, Keeping the tool normal to a separate drive surface can smooth the motion of the tool. In this example, you can see that there are multiple faces to machine. To aid in machining, a single knitted surface has been created from the faces on the model. In the toolpath definition, the knitted surface is used as the drive surface for a projected spiral pattern. Since the surface is already being used for the pattern, you can also use it as the drive surface for the tool. So on the orientation tab, you have the option to align the tool axis to the normals of the drive surface instead of the model. This option is only available with toolpath patterns that use a projected surface. If you set the toolpath pattern to a non-projected pattern, you can see that this orientation strategy is no longer available. Let's set the pattern back to project spiral.
Now we can set the tool axis perpendicular to the drive surface and let's see how it simulates. For any application where the tool needs to pass through a restricted opening, a fixed point is always used to control the rotation of the tool. This prevents the shank of the tool from ever coming into contact with the edges of the opening. The placement of the point depends on the length of the tool and the depth of the cutting passes inside the opening. When defining the point, you can enter coordinates or you can select a point on the screen and the coordinate values will be entered automatically for you. This strategy also allows the placement of the point to be inside a part model. In that case, the tool will be oriented towards the point instead of through it. You can also see that a shank clearance has been defined to prevent the shank of the tool from touching the inside of the opening. Let's see how this looks in simulation. You can see that the tool is only allowed to rotate through that point. Another way to control the tool is to have a pass through a curve. This technique is used for situations where the tool is machining in a channel. When you use a curve to control the tool axis, you have two options. The tool can pass through a curve that lies outside the model, or the tool can be oriented toward a curve that lies inside the model. Let's first take a look at orienting the tool through a curve. I've chosen the drive curve and then I have a few options for how the system calculates the relationship between the points on the drive curve and the contact point of the tool on the model. Since I'm using an open curve on an open channel, I want the points between the two to be synchronized so that when the tool is at the midpoint of the curve, it's also midway along the channel. This time, we'll take a look at the toolpath using toolpath analysis instead of a full simulation. Toolpath analysis is a fast way to verify that the tool is doing exactly what you want it to do. You can set the dialog to show you the trace of the tool at the tip and at the top of the cutting area. You can also show the actual tool axis. At any point along the way, you can clear the trace for a better view. You can also drag the timeline to any point along the toolpath, or click on the timeline to advance or reverse the toolpath by one block. Most of the time, I use toolpath analysis to check the toolpath before I ever run simulation. Now let's take a look at orienting the tool toward a curve. This chain passes through the center of the cylinder, so I'll set toward profile to yes. In this case, I want to use the minimum distance between the curve and the contact point of the tool. Now we'll use toolpath analysis again to watch the orientation of the tool. The last orientation strategy in the composite function lets you set the tool axis to a fixed vector. This is the strategy you use to produce a 3 plus 2 toolpath. The rotary axes first orient the tool axis to the vector you specify. Then the tool is held in that position throughout the cut.
In 5-axis machining, you need to have more control over the tool than a few predefined orientation strategies. You also need to have control over the sideways and forward tilt of the tool as it travels along the toolpath. Tilting the tool gives you more control over the contact point between the tool and the surface being cut. Tilt can be applied to any of the five orientation strategies in the composite function. Especially when you use bull nose and mills, it's not ideal to have the bottom of the tool in contact with the part. Angles can be used to tilt the tool and change the contact point. This is especially useful when machining a turbine blade as shown in this example. Let's go back to the blade example we saw earlier to see how easy it is to modify the orientation. In the original tool path, the tool was oriented normal to the model and tilt was not applied to the tool axis. Now let's see what happens when the inline angle is set to 10 degrees to create a pulling cut with the tool tipped slightly forward. I also want to tilt the tool 25 degrees to the side to move the b-axis head farther away from the chuck since this is a short part. I'm going to tell the system to minimize rotation when these angles are applied and then recalculate the tool path. Now you can see the change in the tilt of the tool and the contact point is now moved away from the bottom of the ball mill. Being able to limit the rotation of a tool axis is particularly important for mill turn machines because each mill turn has specific limits on how much the B axis can rotate. These limits need to be specified in the program so the correct tool path can be output. The composite function lets you limit rotation within a range, which is defined by a minimum and maximum angle. You can also lock an axis and then enter a fixed angle for that axis. With the axis locked, you can also tell the system to offset the tool so it doesn't cut with the bottom of the tool. This allows the production of camshafts, turbine blades, and other types of shaft work that require rotation of the part. An automatic tilt option is also important to 5-axis machining. Let's say you've defined your tool axis orientation, but the system detects a collision before the entire area is machined. At that point, the system will end the tool path because the tool cannot reach the rest of the area in its current position. The auto tilt function lets you define rules about what the system should do in case a collision is detected. When auto tilt is enabled, you can choose the direction in which the tool is allowed to tilt and enter the maximum change in tilt that you'll allow. You can also smooth the transition of the tilt when the auto tilt rule is applied. The auto tilt function allows the rest of the area to be machined without having to create a second tool path or having to start over with a different tool orientation for the entire tool path. The final step in this process is to define the moves the tool makes between the actual cutting passes. For the smoothest surface possible, the manner in which the tool moves from the end of one cutting pass to the start of the next requires finesse and control. Multiple choices in a prioritized list Take the guesswork out of which linking methods are preferred by the machinists. Separate strategies can be created for how the tool approaches the part, how the tool should feed between passes, and how the tool should rapid from one position to another.
The usage of feed links versus rapid links is easily controlled with a single setting, the maximum link distance. You only need to define a maximum distance for feed moves and the system takes care of the rest. As soon as the system detects a gap between cutting passes that's larger than the user defined distance, it'll generate a rapid move. Most CAM systems offer several options for linking moves, but the user typically has to choose just one of those. With 5-axis machining, there are just too many variables with the machine motion to limit the choices for tool transitioning moves. The logical answer is to let the programmer choose a favorite, a next favorite, and so on. For example, top priority can be given to a linking method that keeps the tool on the surface the entire time. But if that method is not possible, then the system can look at the user's list of preferences to see how to behave next. As a second priority, the user prefers a link that lifts the tool off the surface with a radius move and then returns to the surface at the next cut with a tangent radius move. A third priority can be given to a link that lifts the tool completely off the surface. That way, the user can prioritize linking methods and there's less chance that the machining operation will fail or cause gouging because of an inappropriate move when the tool repositions. Now let's review the four steps that we've just gone over. The first step is to define the area to machine. In this case, it's a free form feature that's already been created. The second step is to define the toolpath pattern. We're going to use just a standard parametric pattern and then select the face that we want to take the flow lines from and then decide which of those flow lines we're going to machine along. In this case, we'll use the V direction of the face. Let's change this pattern to a single pass that will go down the middle of the face. We'll just use the default normal to model tool axis orientation and then set the links. In this case, I want to move the vertical approach to the top of the list and change the length of that vertical approach to 10 millimeters. The feed links look okay, so I'm going to leave those the way they are. And then for the rapid link, I'm going to choose to rotate around the z-axis. Now let's calculate the toolpath. And now let's simulate. It's that easy. Four steps. With a single composite function, you can choose any one of the available machining patterns and any one of the available tool orientation strategies to create your own customized toolpath. Add to that the ability to lock an axis and your toolpath is quickly converted to a 4 plus 1 application. Or lock two axes to create a 3 plus 2 program. The choice is up to you. The composite function gives you the flexibility to try out different machining techniques without ever having to re-enter data about the part. We've covered a lot in the last 40 minutes, but now I hope you have a better understanding of 5-axis machines and what they can do for you. You've seen the most common machining patterns for 5-axis and how you can control the tool axis throughout the cut. Here at DP Technology, we want our software to take the complexity out of programming these workhorses of machines. If you have any questions, please shoot me an email at the address shown. I'm interested to know how you like the presentation and if you need more information. This concludes my class. Thank you for attending.